Hi everybody. So on our neck journey, next we're going to have a look at the nut. Well, you would think that, I mean, it's such a simple thing. You would think that there isn't much to say about it, but that turns out not to be the case. There's all kinds of anxiety and discussion about the nut, what it is, how it works best, what it's supposed to do and not do. And I thought I would weigh in with some of my comments and observations on the nut. First of all, we, we're pretty sure that we want the arc of the bottoms of the strings to be the same arc as the arc of the first fret, okay? Or very, very close to that. In fact, it's, it is a little bit more curved than the first fret. And maybe before we do all the way into the nut, we're going to talk about the curvature of the neck. Now, there is a, a common phrase in our field, compound radius, which is a kind of an odd way of describing a conical surface. And we'll go into this in some detail in another episode. But to the point right now, we'll just say that every part of the of a properly dressed fingerboard is a different curve across. So the fingerboard is properly more curved at the nut end and a little bit flatter as it gets towards the bridge. All right, we'll leave it there for now. Back to the compound or so-called compound radius later. On the guitars that I make, this arc radius down here at the nut is 10 inches. And then uh, it changes to 14 inches at the bridge. So you would think 12 at the nut and 13 at the theoretical 24th fret, which there isn't one, but anyway, something like that. At any rate, back to the nut, it's a 10 inch arc radius. And by that we mean that's part of a circle that's 20 inches in diameter. That's why it's a 10 inch radius so that the origin of this arc is 10 inches below this surface and swinging in this way. All right, so a couple of things. First, we can decide to either space the strings evenly with respect to one another, or less often, it's not wrong, less common is to make the spaces in between the strings equal distance. So you can see as the strings get larger, that would mean that they would get farther apart uh, with that, that other method. And it's not something that I do. I actually can't think of a good example of someone who does do it right now. But anyway, so string spacing, let's just say for the sake of argument, means that the centers of all the strings are equally spaced across the string spacing, right? Which is measured from here to here. So on my guitars, the width of the nut is 1.750 or one and three quarters inches. And the distance between the centers of the E strings is about one and a half inches or 1.5 inches. Now, You'll see the way I've, way I've drawn this, that the top string is a little bit farther away from the edge than the bottom string. And this is something that has been common on guitars for a long, long time, probably since the mid 19th century when classical guitars got started. And what that means is that the string group is moved very slightly towards the bass side because the player needs a little bit more room sometimes to play the top string than they do to play the low string. So there's a slight bias, and I emphasize it's slight, but I think you can see it in this view. If we get right over it, you'll be able to see how that string group is biased very slightly towards the bass side. 
Okay. Important not to overdo it. There is some controversy about the height of the nut. And I think that it's a pretty sensible idea that the height of the nut should be the same height as a theoretical zero fret. Some people like to make the nut a little higher than that, but that causes tuning problems because it means that the strings get stretched a little bit more than they would hope to be to contact the first few frets and therefore the note plays sharp on, on this side of the fretboard. Some people have decided that, that it's a good idea to move the nut forward. In other words, shorten the distance between the, the front face of the nut and the center of the first fret in order to improve the tuning characteristics of this part of the fingerboard. And it's actually quite commonly done. And it's been commonly done for centuries. There's nothing new about this. In fact, as usual, probably pointed this out before, it's very difficult to do something new in instrument making since a lot of smart people have been trying to make better instruments for many centuries now. So the idea of, of shortening uh, this, this distance, uh, not changing the scale, but rather very subtly shifting the nut forward. And I would say somewhere between maybe 10 or maybe 15,000. So that would be, you know, 0.25 to maybe 0.3 millimeters closer together. So in other words, shifting the nut in this direction. In the 90s, our wonderful guitar player named Buzzy Feeton decided that that was a good idea. And also he decided to change the temperament uh, or intonation specs on the bridge and had a tuning system called the Buzzy Feeton tuning system, which I think is really not a special system or an invention really. As I say, people have been fooling around with where the nut is for centuries and it's a little hard to take credit for it in the in the 20th century, in my opinion. So anyway, the Buzzy Feeton system was a big deal for a while, but I haven't heard anybody talk about it lately. And when I looked online, it seems like it's kind of died down. Uh, interestingly, I think it was in the 80s, Paul Reed Smith got a patent on moving the nut towards the first fret, which, you know, predated Buzzy Feeton's work by quite a long time. Well, a number of years anyway. And, uh, but I would point out again that it, you can't patent something that was common engineering process uh, hundreds of years ago. Well, as it turns out, you can patent it, but it would be hard to defend that patent in court because whoever you were up against would just cite the fact that people have been moving the nut around um, for centuries. Let me take this as a, just a a moment to mention the idea of ancient instruments and all the inspiration and knowledge that I learned from um, my study of ancient instruments and ancient instrument making. Before there were metal frets, there were frets that were made out of the same organic material as the strings. This was a piece of intestines of a calf or a goat maybe that were stretched out, sliced into really thin strands and then twisted and carefully dried and then used as strings. So the first frets were actually pieces of that, um, you know, waste or broken string, old strings that were just tied properly around the neck so that you could adjust the position of the frets by moving them around by hand. In other words, you could retune the position of the frets as a player. Um, to make the, your instrument sound more consonant in the keys that you preferred. The world of tuning and temperament is a very, very deep one. It's not something that I'm intimately acquainted with. Of course, I've done some reading and I know a little bit about it, but I'm certainly no authority on it. I'm just uh, sticking with the 12th root of two for a derivative of, of frets and uh, regular fret spacing for now. <laughs> you may have seen the, the fret 
designs where the frets are kind of squiggly and wiggle around in an attempt to make things more consonant and, and better in agreement with each other. And there's quite a lot of controversy over whether that's actually achieving that effect or not. And uh, reasonable people can disagree. So I'll just leave it at that. And you can uh, feel free to explore, <laughs> explore that at your peril. Actually, it's, a, it's, um, it's daunting. And again, reasonable people can disagree. So now let's talk about the height of the nut uh, in some detail. So the nut has several functions. It, it holds the strings, as we mentioned, probably equal, equidistant. So the centers are all equidistant across the part. And that makes it more fun for the instrumentalist. And then there's the matter of height. So we've talked about spacing of the, the strings, potentially the subtle shifting of the string group away from the treble side of the neck. And now to the height. We know, and again, we're going to get into this in, in further detail in the fingerboard session, but for now, I think everybody pretty much understands that there's supposed to be a very, very, very subtle, small curve, uh, uh, at least in the first octave of a uh, properly set up guitar neck that we call relief. And um, you can, I don't know if you can see it, but here's the string being gently depressed at the first and the 12th fret. Well, you can hear it anyway. So there, that means that the frets are in a little bit of a curve and the, the string, of course, is straight. And you can see the relief across the fretboard. So um, as it turns out, because of the way the strings behave and the large strings have more mass and they vibrate in a, in a larger uh, envelope or larger shape, that is, the low strings need a little bit more of this curvature, which accommodates the shape of the vibrating string. So the reason for bringing this up briefly is that we know now that, that this first octave, at least, has a little curve in it. So if we can hear something here as in terms of some distance, some space, then stands the reason that that'll even be here too. It's small, but you can hear it. Anyway, what I'm saying is this little curve needs to be extended up and into the nut so that the nut participates in this relief curve. So it's, it's my judgment that when you fret the string gently uh, in front of the second fret, that there should be a tiny little space which you can hear the merest little distance between the string and the fret. And that means that you've got the nut height exactly right. So I'm going to call this critical nut height. And I know there are people that think that the nut should be higher than that. But again, when you do that, you make the lower part of the neck play sharp which nobody wants that. So here's a capo. We'll put a capo on. And I think we'll, we can see that. Whoops, usual capo problem. But anyway. <laughs> Capos, all right. At any rate, what I'm trying to show is that the nut does not need to be extra high. It just needs to be the correct height. And I think the correct height would be exactly the same height as the zero fret. So you can hear that the guitar is not buzzing or doing anything bad with the capo. So again, bear with me. That means that 
this first fret is at the theoretical same height as it would be if the neck scale was here, right? So the other way to handle this is with a zero fret. And here is the only example I have in my shop of a zero fret guitar. And this whole thing needs its own, wow, this needs its own program. Look at this, original strings and tags. Here's how to get the most enjoyment from your new Macaferry guitar. All kinds of cool stuff here. This was designed by a genius named Mario Macaferri. This is a guitar that was injection molded out of special kind of styrene. And Mario Macaferri was not only a virtuoso guitarist who actually tended to specialize in the nine string harp guitar, he was famous and an educator, as his career progressed, he got involved with the Selmer Company in Paris, and he designed a wooden guitar that looks a lot like this, not exactly, but a lot like this. And it was, it was the favorite guitar of our hero, Django Reinhardt. And as a result of Django's use of this guitar, it became very famous and very influential and is still used to this day by a great number of players, mostly European players. Uh, who play in that exciting so-called gypsy jazz style. Anyway, this guitar is a plastic copy of Mario Macaferri's design for the Selmer Company, more or less, and it has a, z a zero fret, which means that the zero fret is the, the thing that sets the fret height, and that's probably, you know, just about right on, looks good to me. A tiny little bit of curvature here. Unfortunately, the plastic has sagged and these grooves are no longer sticking up high enough to keep the strings in the, in the proper place, so that's too bad. In this zero fret configuration, of course, the fret sets the height and then in back of it this piece of material is designed to induce the correct spacing in between the strings, which, you know, unfortunately on this guitar is no longer working. Anyway, that's the zero fret. If this might be an example of the least wonderful embodiment of the zero fret, let us show an image right now of what may be the most elegant embodiment of a zero fret. And this is the work of a genius contemporary builder named Steve Klein, who's been an innovator and a problem solver, inventor, and thought leader in our field for uh, many decades now. And I think you'll see that his work is incredibly elegant and gorgeous. And he created this wonderful design for the zero fret that just adds a little, I don't know what, <laughs> a little special Steve Klein something to the headstock of his guitar. So having said all of this, I don't think it makes any difference whether you use a zero fret or not. It's certainly an okay thing if you do it well, unlike this one. And it doesn't really matter. The object of the nut or the nut system, including the zero fret, if you choose to use that, is to put the string in the right place, up and down, left and right, etc. Pretty simple job, but um, something that uh, gets taken for granted. Many times a player will come in and and complain of his guitar not playing in tune. And sometimes it's an easy one. You just lower the nut and, you know, everything straightens out. That's one way that uh, guitar tuning can be badly affected is by having the nut too high. Finally, I'm going to talk about nut material. When I was young, there was a craze by, you know, some, somebody that wanted to sell you uh, brass nuts and there was a lot of brass hardware on guitars in the 70s. Brass is, you know, yellow colored, at least when it's new. It unfortunately tarnishes to a pretty ugly greeny brown. It's a gummy, heavy metal that's made of copper and zinc. It has poor resistance to corrosion and it's a pretty terrible nut material. But somehow, 
it was foisted on our group <laughs> by some marketing folks who managed to sell some brass nuts for a while. Um, I'm pretty sure that thing has gone out of favor. I remember at the time, I was puzzled at why people were claiming that the nut sounded better since the nut's only responsible for the sound of the first um, six notes, the lowest six notes of open strings on the guitar, after which the nut has nothing to do with the sound. So I took a Telecaster and I made a six-piece nut with a couple different kinds of plastic, piece of bone, piece of brass, a piece of aluminum, a piece of ebony, six materials, and I put uh, the same G string in every position. And my friends and I sat down and tried really hard to hear a difference, but we never heard a difference in the nut material. So if you can, you have better ears than mine. Uh, again, the sound of the nut is not really a big deal. Sound of the bridge is a huge deal because the bridge is involved with every note. Sound of the nut, eh, not really a big deal. And turns out that pretty much any material you want to use for the nut is going to work fine because the nut actually doesn't wiggle much and its job is to simply hold the string in the right place. Simple job. <laughs>